My name's Gavin Jennings and I'm an orthopaedic surgeon specialising in shoulder problems. This presentation is the third of three parts giving an overview of trauma of the shoulder girdle. Parts 1 and 2 dealt respectively with trauma to the bones and the tendons of the shoulder. This part focuses on injuries of the ligaments. The important ligaments around the shoulder include those which stabilise the ball and socket or glenohumeral joint and those which stabilise the acromioclavicular joint or ACJ. The ligamentous stabilisers of the glenohumeral joint include the labrum and its attached capsular thickenings known as the glenohumeral ligaments. The inferior glenohumeral ligaments are the most important for stability. The stabilisers of the AC joint are the acromioclavicular ligaments and more importantly, the coracoclavicular ligaments, which are found between the coracoid process and the undersurface of the clavicle or collarbone. The inner or medial end of the clavicle also attaches to the sternum at the sternoclavicular joint. I will first consider the most common ligament injuries, i.e. those that relate to glenohumeral dislocations. The most common type of glenohumeral dislocation by far is anterior i.e. the humeral head comes out of the front of the socket. These constitute almost 95% of shoulder dislocations. In about 5% of cases, the shoulder dislocates backwards or posteriorly. Unfortunately, posterior dislocations are on occasions missed in the accident and emergency environment. With shoulder dislocations, it's very important to check for axillary nerve function by testing for sensory loss in the mid-deltoid or regimental badge patch area and testing for contraction of the three heads of the deltoid. Posterior dislocations occur in trauma, not surprisingly, with a posteriorly directed force, often in a forward flexed and adducted arm. However, they should also be considered when a patient presents with shoulder pain following a fit. Examination of a patient with a posterior dislocation will reveal very limited external rotation and the so-called light bulb sign on an AP X-ray. Traumatic anterior dislocations, once reduced, are often managed non-operatively. However, surgery is often considered if they've become recurrent or in the first time dislocation in a young contact sportsman. If surgery is considered, almost invariably, this would be preceded with an MRI arthrogram where dye is placed into the joint prior to scanning. This is primarily to confirm the presence of a labral separation or a Bankart lesion, or one of its variants, as shown here. If there's no significant damage to the bones, an arthroscopic Bankart repair is usually the procedure of choice. Acromioclavicular joint dislocations, or separations as they're known elsewhere, such as in the USA, are usually classified according to the progressively worsening damage first the acromioclavicular ligaments, then the coracoclavicular ligaments. Traditionally, we've tended to treat types 4 to 6, where the coracoclavicular ligaments are torn, operatively. More recently, there is a trend to consider even the higher grade injuries for a trial of non-operative management with those patients who failed to recover reasonably rapidly, undergoing delayed surgery to stabilise the joint. Many types of operation have been described over the years, um, but traditionally most of these are a variation on the so-called Weaver-Dunn procedure. This involves a repair of the coracoclavicular ligaments and the use of the coracoacromial ligament to reinforce the repair. More recently, we've tended to use an artificial ligament to take place of the coracoclavicular ligaments rather than attempt a repair. If the patient presents early, it's possible to perform an oral arthroscopic repair using an artificial ligament alone. Finally, I'd like to mention sternoclavicular joint dislocations. These again can be anterior or much more rarely posterior. Posterior dislocations can sometimes represent a medical emergency if there's pressure on the midline structures such as the trachea lying behind it. Emergent reduction is indicated in such cases. Treatment of anterior dislocations will depend on factors 
such as the age of both the patient and the injury. Many thanks for listening to part three of an overview of shoulder girdle trauma. Please do not hesitate to contact me for any further information.